In this video, I'll present how to calculate the chromatic aberration of a lens in Excel. I'm going to focus specifically on what's called the axial color, and let me explain why. There are two kinds of chromatic aberrations. Axial color is a marginal ray aberration. The marginal ray being clearly defined perhaps by a stop in front. If there's no stop in front, it's defined by the edge of the lens. Because of the dispersion of the glass, different wavelengths of light have different marginal focal points. And that's the chromatic aberration that we're going to look at today. Chromatic aberration is entirely a consequence of dispersion in the glass. There's also lateral color, which is an aberration of the chief ray. The chief ray also refracts when it gets to the glass and the different wavelengths of light will refract different amounts. And the measure of lateral aberration is the difference in height at the image of different wavelengths. Lateral color is a consequence of there being a stop in front of the lens because if you move this aperture stop over to the lens, then of course the chief ray passes through the center of the lens and there is no refraction. So lateral color is something that happens when there's a stop and that's why we're going to be talking about axial color today because we're just talking about how to calculate the chromatic aberration of a lens. And the measure of axial color is the difference in marginal focal point for the red light and the blue light, F light and C light. Because we're talking about chromatic aberration, which is caused by the dispersion of the glass, let's talk about the different wavelengths of light and how the glass responds to them. There are letters that are used for the names of various key wavelengths of light. In optical design, three important wavelengths are C light, D light, and F light. Yes, a lowercase d. And they have the colors of red, yellow, and blue. They historically get their names from the spectroscopy of hydrogen and helium. Now there are two key varieties of glass in optics. There's flint glass and crown glass. And flint glass is more dispersive, crown glass is less dispersive. We're going to do an example where, with a flint glass SF2, which is in the shot catalog. It has an index refraction of about 1.64, slightly different values at C, D, and F light. Because aberration calculation is all about differences, we need to maintain these large numbers of significant figures because we're doing literal derivatives when we subtract n at two different wavelengths. Crown glass, on the other hand, is less dispersive and tends to have a lower index. And we're going to use BK7, which is also in the shot catalog, and it has an index of refraction around 1.51 in the visible range, and these specific values are C, D, and F. You can quantify dispersion of a glass by calculating the Abe number, which is the index at D light, that is the central wavelength of the visible spectrum, minus 1, divided by the differences in indices at the edges of the spectrum at F light and at C light. SF2 has a catalog Abe number of about 33.85 and BK7 is 64. These numbers can vary a little bit in catalogs, which is why we're going to calculate the aberration and then we're going to look at what Zmax gets. We need a working equation to calculate the axial color. Begin with lens power. The difference in curvatures on either side of a lens times the index of refraction of the glass minus 1 for a lens in air. And lens power is just 1 divided by the focal length. C is the curvature, that is 1 divided by the radius of curvature. The dispersive power is the differential element of phi. So that if n changes, the change in phi is that. I'll do two little tricks here. First of all, I'll replace dn with the difference in index of refraction between f and c light. Because it's small, I can really consider that to be a differential element. And then I'll multiply this whole thing by 1. So there's the difference in the indices, and for my choice for 1 today is n sub d minus 1 divided by n sub d minus 1. n d minus 1 divided by n f minus c is what we call the Abe number. So replace that with the Abe number, and you have a simplified expression that the dispersive power, d phi, the differential in power due to dispersion, is the difference in curvatures times the index of d light minus 1 divided by the Abe number. And then recognize that the stuff in the numerator here is the power of the lens specifically at d light. So I'll call that phi sub d, the power of the lens for the d wavelength. This alone is not enough information. Let's use this top expression here, definition of lens power, to get a different expression for dispersive power. d phi by dF, where f is the focal length, 
is minus 1 over f squared, or written this way. So the dispersive power is also that. So now we have two things that we can equate. Dispersive power is minus df over f squared, but it's also the power at d light divided by the Abe number at d light. So equate those two items, multiply both sides by y squared, which gives us an expression that has meaning if you have the geometrical arrangement of the lens in front of you. What y is, is the height of the incoming ray, and it strikes the lens at a height of y, and then it refracts and it hits the optic axis at a distance f away from the lens, the marginal focal point. This is a marginal ray. U prime describes this angle relative to the normal. Actually, tangent of u prime is f divided by y, but in the paraxial approximation, tangent is the angle. So u prime is f divided by y, so I go back to the expression here, and I see f squared and y squared here. I see u prime squared in the denominator. That is the refraction angle relative to the horizontal. And then rearrange this, and you have an expression for the shift in focal point between two different colors of light. In Zmax, that's called LAXC, and it is the axial color focal shift given by what you get when you rearrange this expression, 1 over u prime squared times y squared phi sub d over nu sub d, measured in units of length, millimeters is my preferred length. CLA is this portion of it, the y squared phi sub d over nu sub d. It's the longitudinal aberration which shows up in the Seidel table in Zmax. The two is units of length. Given that the catalog Abe number, which is agreed to be the difference in F and C light, is used, we have the focal shift between F and C light in this expression. We're going to simulate a lens that has front surface radius R1 and back surface radius R2. We'll make the lens out of NBK7 glass and thickness, T1. And I put all the paraxial ray tracing equations into an Excel spreadsheet along with calculation of the marginal focus for different wavelengths. At this point, if you need to, you can return to the video on the YNU spreadsheet in order to get the background on what this spreadsheet is all about. It contains the paraxial ray tracing equations which are explained in that video. So I use a radius on the front of 30 millimeters and a radius on the back of minus 30 millimeters. And the blues are input data. The black entries are calculated from formulas. The curvature is just one over the radius. It doesn't really matter what you choose for a height, so I just set it at 10 millimeters. And then we have the indices of refraction and put it in. The air on the left and the air on the right both have an index of 1. NBK7 has these particular values of index of refraction for F, D, and C light. The powers are calculated, and then the paraxial ray tracing equations are used to determine the height of the ray at each surface, surface 1 and surface 2. The transfer angle relative to the horizontal is calculated, and it's done separately for FD and C light, and the place where the FD and C light each hit the optic axis is computed from a triangle, and we have the marginal focus for each one of them. From that, we can calculate the df, which is just the difference between the f light and c light marginal focus. So let's go to Excel and look at this. So you put in the 30 millimeters and the minus 30 millimeters, so the radius of the back sur surface. Then the curvature is calculated, just 1 divided by those radii. Put in a thickness for the lens, 5 millimeters. I'll put the object infinitely far away. That ensures that the ray coming in is parallel to the optic axis and I'll give it a height of 10 millimeters. Indices are all populated for the different materials, vacuum and MBK7. The powers of each surface are calculated. That's the difference in the indices in front of and behind the surface times the curvature of that surface. You can see the same equation for each one of those powers. Now the refraction has to be accounted for, but it is different for each wavelength. So let's begin with F light. The ray is launched from the object at a height of 10 millimeters. It will reach the lens at that same height of 10 millimeters. Even though there's an equation in here, the ray doesn't, doesn't have an angle. The formula is the original height plus the distance from the object to the front of the lens times the angle it's making. That product is zero. Then the ray refracts from the normal at an angle u. 
I have the spreadsheet set up so that it calculates this omega, which you can find in Geary's textbook. It's uh, the original angle of zero minus the ray height times the power. U then is just that omega divided by n, the index of refraction. I could combine these two cells into one cell if I wanted to, but I didn't. And the same happens then for surface 2. Now these thicknesses in row 5 are the distance after the surface. So the distance from surface 1 to surface 2 is 5 millimeters. And likewise, the angle that the ray makes after it passes through surface 1 is minus 0.11438 radians. And the angle it makes after it passes through surface 2 is minus 0.3383 radians relative to the horizontal. Do the same thing again for D light. The only thing that's different is a different index of refraction, which then affects the power. The power is calculated separately for each wavelength in rows 10, 11, and 12, and those powers are used in the omega calculations. And again, u is just omega divided by the index. So now to get the marginal focus, look at what's going on after surface 2. That's the back surface. So you'll see that I have a formula in cell E5 which is the distance from surface 2 to the optic axis. That's calculated down here in cell H15. And that's the marginal ray height as the ray leaves the back surface divided by the angle that it makes with the horizontal. The minus sign accounts for the fact that it's making a negative angle with respect to the horizontal. All we want to do is evaluate the long leg of a triangle, so we have to take the minus sign out. Do that for each wavelength. DF, the operand in Zmax is LACX, is the difference between the marginal focus for F and C light. Take the difference between cells H15 and H23. Now, careful, it's F light focal point minus the C light focal point. And that's why we have a negative value for LACX, the axial chromatic aberration operand in Zmax is negative. Now CLA is simply LACX times the angle squared. So this E21 is the angle that the marginal ray has left the back surface with. That's your axial aberration coefficient in Zmax. The reason for doing this in Excel is so you can understand what's happening underneath the hood in more expensive lens design software, and you understand then what these operands for the aberrations mean numerically. And so let's benchmark what we just did against lens design software. This is the result from ZMAX where you have lens set up, two radii of curvature 30 millimeters and minus 30 millimeters and NBK7 glass. Polychromatic light comes in and the C, D, and F light refracts at slightly different angles. Zoom in on the marginal focus where the, the bottom marginal ray and the top marginal rays meet. F light, which is blue, focuses before C light, which is red which gives an axial color of minus 0 0.46136 millimeters. We calculated minus 0 0.44575 millimeters with our spreadsheet. The discrepancy is most likely in the dispersion data that is used in ZMAX as opposed to the data that I looked up for our purposes. It's a good question to ask about field. I set the spreadsheet up to look only at light that is incident parallel to the optic axis. But what about light coming in at a field angle? So repeating the same exercise in ZMAX at a 15 degree field, we find LACX equal to minus 0.43997 millimeters as minus. So not much different. This is an important takeaway that the axial chromatic aberration does not depend strongly on field angle. And so I'm satisfied with my spreadsheet only doing the angle parallel to the optic axis. This can go to a multi-lens system. As an example, let's do the cemented achromatic doublet, which is a lens design that minimizes and even eliminates axial chromatic aberration. So accomplished by combining a converging lens made out of crown glass with a diverging lens made out of flint glass. The word cemented in the name of this design indicates that the two lenses have surfaces that mate and are then cemented together. The back radius of curvature for lens A equals the front radius of curvature for lens B. For simplicity, I'm just going to make the very back surface planar. 
Our design goal then is to make a cemented achromatic doublet lens that has a 32 millimeter focal length and doesn't have axial color. I would say minimum axial color, but I want no axial color. And we need to use NBK7 for the crown glass, lens A, and SF2 for the flint glass, lens B. So before you go and put a design into any sort of computer number cruncher, you should do a pre-design on paper. So let's do the pre-design for this achromatic doublet. That is, let's determine radii of curvature that work for us. There is a procedure for playing the power of lens A off of lens B. That procedure is summarized in several optics textbooks. Chapter 16 of Geary will summarize that. In fact, I will reference you to equation 1623 in Geary if you have that book. The power of the first lens should be the power that you want the combined lenses to have, which is 1 over 32 millimeters, times this ratio of Abe numbers. It would take that 32 millimeters to be exact, since it's a design goal, not a measured quantity. And that's the power that that first lens needs to have. Likewise, the second lens. Now the general expression for the power of a thin lens is the difference in indices of the glass and the medium outside the lens and the difference in curvatures. That's equation 420 in Geary. If we're designing this to operate in vacuum, then n sub medium is just 1. This equation can then be used for each one of the two lenses. First lens, made out of crown, where the curvatures are with the 1 divided by the radius of curvature. But we already know that has to equal this thing, 0 0.066138. So that's a working equation, one equation with two unknowns. Let's look at lens B. The third surface is a flat planar surface, so it has zero curvature. And we already know that this has to equal that thing. You have two equations and two unknowns, where C3 is zero. Solve them. You'll get C2 is minus 0 0.053865 per millimeter, or invert that. Given C2, you can solve for C1, and you get R1. And we took as a given that R3 is infinity. So these are the radii that we will put into the YNU spreadsheet. The YNU spreadsheet also needs extra surfaces so we can have that second lens. Before we go to the YNU spreadsheet for a two lens system, I want to comment on two types of spectral distributions of light that we have to be concerned with as we begin to minimize chromatic aberration. When we design an achromatic lens, we reduce the primary spectrum. The equations we just went through were developed to bring the focal point of F-light and C-light to the same place. But that doesn't guarantee that the focal point of D-light will move into the same place. The primary spectrum refers to the separation between the focal points of the F and C light, and the secondary spectrum refers to the residual aberration that still exists because D light has a different focal point. And so different words are used, primary color, secondary color, primary spectrum, secondary spectrum. You have to rely on optimization to bring down the secondary spectrum. Optimizing lens design software becomes necessary to reduce secondary color. There are a few design principles that help to keep secondary spectrum to a minimum, one of which is to maximize the difference in Abe numbers between the crown glass and the flint glass. Let me remind you first that when we did the singlet, we found axial color of minus 0.4457 millimeters. That's pretty large. Half a millimeter means that the red and the blue light are arriving at the optic axis at the marginal focus half a millimeter apart from each other. That's a pretty blurry image with a noticeable color separation. With the achromatic cemented doublet, this is significantly improved. There are three surfaces in the lens, it would seem, but I'm going to consider four surfaces for the sake of a more versatile YNU spreadsheet. So surface one is the front surface, 
surface two is the back surface of lens A and surface three is the front surface of lens B and they are the same surface. Surface four then is the back surface of lens B. By building the YNU spreadsheet that way we have the option of actually putting distance between these two lenses. So it's the same spreadsheet as before only now we had to add these two surfaces and following a ray through the second lens that is past surface 2 onto surface 3, past surface 3 onto surface 4 and then finally using the right triangle rule to find out how far the light goes until it strikes the optic axis. D light hits the optic axis at 32 millimeters F light at 32.0156 and C light at 32.0166. Notice that F light and C light are hitting the optic axis close to each other. D light is off from them. That's the scenario I just described before with the secondary color. So that small separation between the F and C light then translates into a small LACX operand. Remember, that's just the difference between these two marginal focal points for F and C light. Instead of being half a millimeter, it's a micron. CLA is half a micron. So this design has a very significant influence on chromatic aberration. Let's look at the actual Excel file. Now we can look at some of the cell formulas. Again, the blue are numbers that just got put in, and these are the radii of curvature we calculated in the pre-design. I'm going to start with just putting in zero thickness. So we're dealing with very thin lenses. Uh, we can play with that a little bit later. And again, the height is just 10 millimeters. And the indices of refraction are all given. After surface 4, it's air, so that's 1. Before surface 1, after the object, it's air, so that's 1. Otherwise, we have other values. It doesn't matter what I use between surface 2 and 3 because the thickness is 0. I just made it air. And I might make surface 2 have some thickness. That would be the same thing as a spacing between the two lenses. The powers of each surface are calculated next, and resist the urge to overthink this. When calculating the powers of surfaces and then of lenses, you're looking at the lens by itself in vacuum. Just what is the power of that surface on that lens in vacuum? And so the first expression is D7 minus C7, that is the index of refraction of the glass compared to vacuum times D4, the curvature. And the next one, it's E7 minus D7, the index of refraction of vacuum compared to glass. So on and so forth. The next one, it's the index of refraction of the glass compared to the vacuum. So if we're considering these things in vacuum. The marginal ray heights are calculated in rows 15, 19, and 23. You might think it looks funny that it's 10 millimeters all the way across. But that's because right now I have zero put in for the thicknesses. And so with the zero thickness, the light ray has no opportunity to change elevation. Put in a thickness, like say I put in 5, we get a different elevation of the ray when it hits the next surface. Everything else, though, is done the same. For example, the calculation of ray height is based on the thickness leading up to that surface, the angle of the ray leading up to that surface, and the height when it arrived at that surface, and so on and so on and so on, just progressively onward. So you can add surfaces continuously. You just have to make sure the equation follows that pattern. And finally, when you get to surface 4, again, I have a cell G5 is a formula. It's not an input number because that's the place where the D light hits the optic axis. And this cell is just borrowed from J19, and you go down to J19, and you can see how that's calculated from a triangle. J19 is G19, the height, divided by G21, the angle that locates the long edge of a triangle where the ray hits the axis. Again, the operand LACX is calculated by just taking the difference in the F light and C light marginal focus, and it's extremely small. Because the achromatic design equations were intended to put C light and F light focal point at the same place. Now that you have this spreadsheet, you can play with things a little bit. For example, give these lenses some thickness, 5 millimeters and 5 millimeters. I keep a zero there because it is a cemented doublet. And notice what happens to the chromatic aberration. It got bigger, and I can make it thicker, and the chromatic aberration will get bigger. Well, now you can begin the process of bringing this back down. 
you have numbers to play with here. These radii are available for you to play with. And like, okay, 13.49. Uh, what happens if I make it 13? Oh, yeah, it got bigger. Let's try this one. Minus 18.56, make it minus 18. Uh, cell F3 is locked to cell E3. And that improved it. Let's try minus 17. And it continues to improve. Minus 16. At some point, it's going to stop improving. And it's between minus 12 and minus 13. I think there we go. We have ourselves another achromatic doublet, but it's more realistic because there's a thickness to the lenses. They're 10 millimeters thick. But with these radii, we can still have our achromaticity. You can write your own Y and U spreadsheet. In fact, you should write your own Y and U spreadsheet. Don't copy this one. Write your own. Use it to optimize designs like I just demonstrated and to understand the operands that your optical design software gives you as results.